Alterations in elimination, gastrointestinal, pathophysiology and management. Looking at the anatomy and physiology of the GI tract, first of all, we start with the mouth. This is where mastication or chewing begins. Food that contains starch undergoes partial digestion because of the salivary amylase. It moves on down to the esophagus. It is located at the beginning of the pharynx and goes down to the stomach opening. The muscle tissue surrounds the esophagus and peristalsis is defined as the coordinated movement of those muscles to help propel food through the esophagus to the stomach. The upper esophageal sphincter will prevent air from entering the esophagus and the stomach, and the lower esophageal sphincter, also known as the cardiac sphincter, helps prevent gas contents from entering the esophagus. The stomach will temporarily hold ingested food and begins to prepare it in a semi-liquid form that we call chyme. The pyloric sphincter is located between the stomach and the small, stu uh, small intestine, and gastric secretions are going to help break that food down into chyme. The emptying time from the stomach will be determined by the amount and the composition of the food that's ingested. Now the small intestine is about 23 feet long, and it's divided into three portions. Its primary function is to absorb nutrients from chyme. The duodenum is the first portion, and this is where bile and pancreatic enzymes will enter the duodenum through the ducts to help break down fats, carbohydrates, and proteins. The chyme is then propelled through the small intestine by peristalsis. The next portion of the small intestine is the jejunum, and then finally we have the ileum. And the ileocecal valve will separate the ileum and the cecum, and it controls the flow of intestinal contents and helps prevent the reflux of feces into the small intestine. The large intestine is about four to five feet long, and its primary function is to receive waste from the small intestine, absorb water, some electrolytes, and bile acids. It consists of the cecum and the colon, with the ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoid portions of the colon, the rectum, and the anal canal. The appendix is a blind tube at the tip of the cecum that has no known function in humans. Now when the fecal mass reaches the rectum, it's held there by contraction of the anal sphincters until distension occurs, which stimulates the urge to defecate. There are also accessory structures, and this includes the peritoneum, which encloses the abdominal organs. And we have three digestive organs. The liver, which is a glandular organ that forms bile, processes vitamins, proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. It also stores glycogen and helps with coagulation. It metabolizes chemicals, bacteria, and foreign matter, and forms antibodies and immunizing substances. The gallbladder stores bile that, when it's, re it's the gallbladder stores bile that is released when food, especially fats, is ingested. The pancreas is an exocrine and endocrine gland. It produces enzymes to digest fats, proteins, and carbohydrates, and it also produces insulin and glucagon. So true or false, the esophagus temporarily holds the food. This is false, that's the stomach. So when obtaining a nursing assessment regarding the GI tract, we look at the objective. And the objective of the history is to identify the client's specific problem and its possible cause. It should include the chief complaint, 
a focus assessment of current nutritional, metabolic, and elimination patterns in past history. The focus is going to be on abdominal pain, issues with digestion, nausea and or vomiting, constipation or diarrhea, incontinence or other complaints. Determine the client's use of tobacco or alcohol in any adverse reactions to food. When looking at the physical side, we look at the general appearance, the client's skin, including abnormal colors, scars, and mucous membranes, the mouth, looking for sores, lesions, tooth condition, missing teeth, dentures, or how those dentures fit. We look at the abdomen. It should be assessed with the client in a supine position and the knees slightly bent. This helps relax those abdominal muscles. We observe the shape, auscultate, palpate, and percuss. We may also do measurements when distension is present and make sure that you mark the place that you measure with a permanent marker. The anus is inspected looking for hemorrhoids, skin tags or fissures, skin integrity, and stool characteristics. Diagnostic tests can include uh, radiographic studies. They will help identify location, structural appearance of organs in the abdomen, chest, or GI system. And we may also use radiopaque contrast media or fluoroscopy. We may do a barium swallow or upper gastrointestinal series. A fluoroscopic observation may look at the esophagus. This can help identify structural abnormalities of the esophagus with swallowing dysfunction or oral aspiration. The, <clears throat> uh, it's then x-rayed, so we can do x-ray observation. Pre-procedural requisites of this procedure is going to be a low residue diet, a laxative, and uh, cease smoking. Post-procedural requisites would be to drink fluids liberally and obtain stool specimens and potentially laxatives. Small bowel series is done with fluoroscopy of the small intestine to identify obstructions in the jejunum or the ileum, tumors, or inflammation. Enterocolysis would be include a small bowel enema. We can also do a barium enema or a lower gastrointestinal series to identify polyps, tumors, inflammation, strictures, and abnormalities of the colon. We can observe the rectum, sigmoid colon, and descending colon fluoroscopically. We'll ask the client to make position changes and retain the instilled barium and obtain stool specimens. Restrictions and procedures will be to reduce the formation of stool and to help remove any residual stool. We can do an oral cholecystography or a gallbladder series to identify stones in the gallbladder, common bile duct, and tumors, and the ability to store a dye-like iodine-based radiopaque contrast medium. With the radiography, this should be performed before other GI examinations. And with the dye tablets, there should be no eating or drinking. Um, they may do a fatty test meal, however. Cholangiography will determine the patency of the ducts from the liver and the gallbladder. It, the gallbladder is not distinctly visible and vomiting can interfere with oral dye. There are some specific cholangiographies, the ERCP, the intraoperative, the MRCP and the PTC. We can do radionuclide imaging, which would detect lesions of the liver or pancreas and assist in evaluating gastric emptying. We, uh, to do that procedure, inject IV or 
orally ingested radionuclides. The CT scan will detect structural abnormalities of the GI tract and metastatic lesions. The hollow GI organs, uh, the barium sulfate or IV calcium phosphate might be used. But before the test, we try to clean out the bowels. Non-radiographic studies would include the MRI, which uses magnetic energy rather than radiation, to examine the GI structures. We can also use oral contrast agencies. Ultrasonography is a high-frequency sound wave that will detect the size and location of organs, and it outlines structures, abnormalities, cholelithiasis and pyloric stenosis, and appendicitis changes. A percutaneous liver biopsy would obtain liver tissue and examine it microscopically. It helps detect malignant changes, infectious or inflammatory processes, liver damage, and signs of rejection in clients that have received a liver transplant. These clients need to lie on their right side for two hours, but spend eight to 12 hours in bed. We obtain vital signs monitor bleeding, swelling, or hematomas because this is a very vascular organ, and also monitor for breath sounds. A gastrointestinal endoscopy is a visual examination of the lumen of the GI tract using a flexible fiber optic endoscope, and it evaluates the appearance and integrity of the GI mucosa and also detects lesions. We can also do washings with the endoscope, and we can also do biopsies with it. Different lab tests would include a complete blood count, urinalysis, serum bilirubin, cholesterol, serum ammonia level, prothrombin time, protein electrophoresis, and enzymes. We can do a common tumor marker blood study if cancer is suspected a gastric analysis or the H. pylori test, the hydrogen breath testing, and stool analysis. So true or false, an upper gastrointestinal series identifies structural abnormalities of the esophagus, swallowing dysfunction, and oral aspiration. This is true. After a liver biopsy, how many hours should a patient stay in bed? Eight to 12 hours.